viewers of the Civic Space TV, friends of the Youth Roundtable, welcome to yet another episode of the Youth Roundtable. Today we shall have a conversation around a very interesting topic, one which has made headlines in the past couple of two weeks, which is the Russia-Ukraine crisis and war, if you may wish to call it. Many of us of the now generation look at this as a recent um, development. But historians will tell you that this began way back in 2014, when the Ukraine president back then refused to sign an agreement that was meant to um, uh, put Ukraine under the U European Union economic channel and political influence. Ukraine was under influence and duress of Russia and therefore they did not sign the agreement. This led to protests on the streets of Kyiv and this led to the ousting of the then president who was seen as a pro-Russian president. This therefore led to Russia having strong military bases on the borders of Ukraine and as of a few weeks ago, they launched a full-scale attack and invasion on the people of Ukraine. So today we are here to appreciate what this means for both Ukraine and Russia, but above all for the international community. And to enable us to understand this conversation, I'm joined by, usually, of course, a panel of distinguished ladies and gentlemen, young, but also well-educated, uh, I should say, and well-knowledgeable around areas such as this. And let me just introduce them to you. From my extreme left is uh, a comrade and friend of mine, Ndugu Maxon Muezi. Maxon is um, a member of the National Resistance Movement, Youth Wing. I also know that he's a political scientist. Thank you. Comrade Maxon, do you want to say hello to the viewers? Thank you so much, uh, the viewers. I'm happy to have the opportunity to be hosted on the Youth Round Table. Yes, many thanks for joining us. Thank you. Next to uh, Comrade Maxon is a second timer on the Youth Round Table. Comrade Yvonne Pambara. Yvonne is a lawyer by profession, but also I understand that she is the director and founder of um, African Youth Caucus, which is a United Nations development model, if I'm to say. Yvonne, you're most welcome once again, and our viewers would love to listen to your voice. Uh, thank you, Moses. Uh, hello, everyone. I am glad to be here once again, and definitely looking forward to this conversation. Oh, yeah. thank you. Very, very brief today. Uh, next to him is uh, my brother, all the way from Gulu, like, like myself, Comrade Okat Oola Sam. Sam is equally a lawyer. I also know that he is the founder of the Economic Mis Misfit, and also he offers advisory role to the African Minerals uh, Development and among other things. Sam, you're most welcome. Thank you, my fellow Africans. Looking forward to <coughs> a fruitful discussion. Oh, thank you. Next to Sam and uh, on my immediate left is um, Comrade Adeline Nachtende. I hope I've pronounced the name right. Nachtende is a member of the U Uganda Young Democrats. And she's here as a first time as well. Nachtende, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Moses. And I'm glad to be here for the very first time and looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Okay, many thanks. Um, this being a women's week, I will give the women uh, the opportunity to begin this conversation. And let me come to you, Yvonne. Yvonne, um, the now generation of today sees this crisis as a recent development, but historians like you, I, I assume, know that this goes or traces back to 2014. Mm -hmm. For the benefit of our viewers, could you draw a historical perspective and background to where we find ourselves today? Uh, one, I want to make a very key emphasis. Uh, I am not an expert on Ukraine, okay. neither am I an expert on Russia. I'm mostly an expert on African issues. So the way I'm going to address most of the issues today is from a point of view of an expert in Africa, but not on their issue. Uh, so I want us to generally take that stand. I think you gave a definite brief background. Mm. And uh, in terms of their history and whatnot, I'm honestly sorry. Mm. That's not a standout take because I'm not an expert. Okay. Yeah. Let me pass the ball to the man in yellow. I know uh, <laughs> members of the revolutionary movement uh, t tend to have keen interest in historical facts because history shapes both the present and the future. So, Ndugu Maxon, you have the opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, happy Women's Day. Uh, to all Africans and to uh, John Perkins wrote and said that um, uh, economic hitmen 
mm. a rocket of the global empire mm. who influence various countries across the globe mm. through politics economics elections mm. money um, and uh, many things now uh, so many years ago uh, Ukraine was part of the of the greater USSR mm. but uh, because USSR was so huge that was the reason it had to break the sole reason because of politics but also its size uh, its size so it had to to, to, to to break off but still Russia kept some influence there so after that of course because of politics the geopolitics and uh, the western wanted to, to 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 have also influence in the ukraine they decided that uh, they can install a president <coughs> mm. that is pro west mm. that did not work out really mm. and uh, russia instead got the, 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 their favorite. Mm. Like you said in the introduction, the, the Ukrainians did not appreciate that very uh, president. Mm. So they had to protest and eventually the government had to, mm. to fall. But even when the, that, that government fell, the global empire, its role is to make sure we have baby kings what they call baby kings, the pseudo leaders. Mm. Mm. I am sorry to say, but uh, President Zelensky is part of that creation. Mm. That the West France said the government can only run on their projections mm. and also order. Yes. So since there has been a military contestation between the West and Russia, there are a lot of developments, military developments, uh, construction of nuclear power plants, uh, construction of very, very deadly weapons, but also uh, uh, undertaking a lot of operations that are against Russia. Russia really couldn't uh, withstand it, and uh, the most intriguing was uh, parliament mm. wanting to to influence Ukraine to go to, to, to the NATO, but also to the European Union. Mm. As neighbors, and as a strong uh, power, really Russia couldn't allow. So it started assembling mm. machinery next to Ukraine, and it kept warning mm. that any time I'm attacking, on the 24th uh, last month, uh, Russia launched a full-scale mm. invasion on Ukraine. <coughs> we have seen more than 1.3 million refugees now to Poland, to, 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 to other European countries. We have seen a number of uh, uh, events unfold. And uh, that is what we know as Russia-Ukraine war. And it's what we are discussing today. Okay. Um, many thanks. I was afraid that you are going to, uh, to take us... Uh, a couple of steps ahead, but I'm glad that you posed it right there. Thank you. Um, Comrade Sam, um, the, core, the core issue at the time when President Victor had um, protests against him was the mere <laughs> fact that he had failed to sign a political association and free trade agreement with the European Union. Instead, he chose closer ties with Russia and um, the Russian uh, and the Eurasian Economic Union. So. To me, this shows that there is an economic aspect attached to all these crises. And I don't believe that part of the role you do with, with economic misfit is around, you know, the economy and, you know, appreciating values that the economy has, you know, the body politic that comes with the economy. So uh, just to add on to what Maxon said, do you have a different background or do you have something to add? Yeah. To um, how we find ourselves as a world today here? Yeah, I mean... Uh, the world is defined by power blocks. Yeah. If you read Will Durant's The Summary of History, yes. he talks about civilizations of the North coming to conquer the South, and a few centuries later, the South going to conquer the North and picking all their civilization, knowledge, 
And so the world is run upon power blocks. The power block that, the area that we are talking about, the buffer zone that is Ukraine, mm. going into the Balkans, Crimea, mm. Belarus, these areas that have been polarized, it's yes. not the first time. Mm. These are remnants of Roman Empire, which was inherited by the Ottoman Empire, yes. which was inherited by Russia. Yes. I mean, it was solidified in the Warsaw Pact after World War yes. II, you know. But if you read Fukuyama, mm. what he calls the end of history, mm. the triumph of neoliberalism, is what brings us to this point. Mm. There was an arc between Viktor um, Lukashenko of, mm. of Belarus and Putin mm. to cry, try and create a triangular, you know, the, the, the last standpoint, the last buffer zone that Russia can hold yes. against NATO. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, just like <coughs> Fukuyama said, there's been a cultural transformation of the Ukrainian people, mm. a departure from what? The, 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 you know, the communist, the former USSR mentality mm. that then brings us to this point in time, mm. yeah, where we have, uh, you know, Russia still believes Ukraine is part of it, but culturally a lot of Ukrainians have moved. Yeah. We cannot, though, state that there, there is no Russian bloc within Ukraine. There's a eastern side that actually still supports a lot of the Russian uh, movement, the Rus USSR ideology, mm. and believes in it, actually speaks Russian as well. Mm. So, yes, there's definitely that economic perspective. And uh, this is all what we call Nash equilibrium. Mm. There are things we know that were going to happen, and they're happening, and they'll continue to happen. So just like my colleague here, I prefer that we maintain a sober conversation mm. around how this affects Africa. Mm. I think we should keep in the spirit of the Bandang Conference of 1955, where our forefathers, Jawalal Nehru, Abdel Nasser, mm. Kwame Nkrumah, sat and said, we shouldn't waste time aligning with these movements because we actually have Africa to build. Mm. So in that sense, I would like us to further the conversation on a sober path of how this affects Africa, or if it doesn't affect us, how do we as Africans provoke young people to think soberly about our future? Yeah, um, thank you. Because um, so many African countries, and Uganda, one of them, are signatories to the United Nations. Yeah. The United Nations is a global village. Yeah. <clears throat> so whatever happens at a global scale, like you said, one way or another affects us as a country. Yeah. So it is almost inevitable for us to avoid these conversations. But well, we shall try to keep it in the context of, of Africa. And yes, if, I mean, we, we have... And if need be, narrow it down to Uganda yes, as a country. We, we have humanitarian concerns as well. You, you have friends in Russia. Yes. Uh, you, you, you are in Moscow. Uh, I have friends in Ukraine as well. Yes. My friend's house was bombed. Mm. So we actually have these humanitarian concerns that yes. we care about. And we'll, we also have issues like racism, how this has exposed Western racism. Mm. Yeah, and we'll talk about them. But we need to keep it in that context. Well, fair yeah. enough. Um, Comrade Nachitende, you've heard the background that uh, Comrade Moezi has given us and uh, Dugusam. Um, what is your own understanding? Let me give you an opportunity just like I've given everyone else. Well, thank you. Uh, the Ukraine-Russia crisis, basically in connection to the international community. I personally don't even believe in the international community because they have their own selfish interests. Mm. It is about exploitation and basically, I do not want us to appear like we want to concern ourselves. Mm. Though, humanly, we need to, but it doesn't concern us so much would rather concentrate on how best we build Africa. Well, because I will tell you that it actually concerns us so much. Mm -hmm. Because when there's a crisis on the globe, one way or another trade is affected. Okay? The movement of goods and services is affected. Right now, Russian planes cannot land on certain international airports. Okay? Like uh, Comrade um, Maxim said, the refugee um, numbers have heightened. So we are part of the global community and these, we must have these conversations. But anyway, um, I, I appreciate where you're coming from. Ndugu Maxon, let me come to you. You seem very interested in this conversation, mm -hmm. contrary to our mm -hmm. colleagues. 
and uh, the issue of, of NATO, okay? And um, Russia, upon building its base on the borders of Ukraine, kept on warning, like you said, that we are going to attack. But also there was NATO presence, okay? NATO equally began to develop presence within Ukraine. <clears throat> and I recall Putin made a statement and said that uh, uh, NATO's military presence in Ukraine is a threat to them and he is not comfortable with it. So uh, the role of NATO in all this, because NATO is a military convention of you know, the West, has it had a, a significant role in bringing us to where we are today? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, realistically mm. and uh, politically, everything falls and, and rises on leadership, That's true. on politics. And we all know, agree here that the world is split in two, two. The East, the West. The communists versus the, Capitals. the, the, the capitalists. That's why I say <laughs> the economic question. And these two are split by so-called ideology. What do you believe in? What do I believe in? that drives my politics, that drives my democracy, that drives my culture, that drives the economy. Here is that uh, it is very, very unfortunate to say that my neighbor, my immediate neighbor, should have the deadliest weapons, should have uh, the, 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 my deadliest enemies, then it means I'm, I'm in danger. Mm. If my immediate neighbor for instance, has, uh, has weapons, has uh, the rebels there, mm. everything. Then it means I'm also not safe as, as, as such. Mm. That's, that's specifically what took Russia there. Mm. And, 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 and NATO is Europe summarized. Mm. But as we see, it is now a barking dog. It is a barking dog. And what we see is uh, what I pre predict as an individual is the continuity, the continuity and continuous uh, sharing and bombardment of the Ukraine until that pseudo leader I, I talked about, mm. until the pseudo leader, the so-called pseudo leader, understands that sometimes political miscalculations are unfortunate to the population and to countries. As mm. the only solution really is now to to cut. I can say it without fear of contradiction that the only uh, uh, solution is to cut the deal or to make a deal with Russia and, 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 and the, the humanitarian crisis like you was talking about can only, can only stop there. Yeah. But without that... Yeah. Uh, Are you saying that the world should come to the feet of Russia? No, 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 no. It, it shouldn't. But mm. like the world, like I said, is a jungle. Mm. The fittest survive. survives. Mm. So the question is, Russia, and, and you understand that Russia is the greatest, the, the largest country in the world. Yeah. It is not just the largest by population or even by size. Even military power, it is very strong. But when you look at 1960s, 1970s, uh, the, the, the center of gravity of the entire West is the United States. 1960s, 1970s, it used to spend 11.5% of, of its GDP on military power. It now spends 3.5. Now it has reduced. Russia has has instead has scaled up. doubled. Mm. Now, you're talking about <coughs> who is the fittest in this particular case. And we also know that its allies have not yet spoken. You're talking of North Korea, you're talking of China, you're talking of Cuba, you're talking... They have not said anything. Mm. Russia is still invading. In the morning I was listening to, 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 to BBC and they were saying that... Uh, the, the, the Ukrainian president is considering running to Poland so that he can start commanding from there. Mm. Mm. <laughs> get, things so, are very hot in this country. <laughs> things are very hot. They are almost, they are bombarded Kharkiv, they are bombarded Man, Ma, Mariupol. They are, Kiev. Now they are advancing, advancing slowly, slowly, and they have not used their strongest tactic, the air base, mm. the air uh, material. They are just on ground. Mm. So by the time they resort to the deadliest machines of the airspace, mm. 
you know, civilians will be dead. You'll be no more. Let me just pick it up from there. Mm -hmm. The deadly machines. And uh, Comrade Yvonne, let me come to you. Yes, we saw yes. what happened in the World War One, World mm -hmm. War Two, And uh, there was an aspect of the Cold War, yes, but also there was the nuclear um, war aspect that happened, you know, some time back. Mm -hmm. Now, what is l luring and what is happening between Ukraine and, and Russia? Could it be prospects for another World War? Uh, first of all, Moses, let me correct a few statements you made before. We are all interested in this conversation, okay. but our humble opinion was, let's restructure how we are actually discussing it. You know, it's uh, a bit important for us to be um, having conversations on, for example, the kind of uh, model democracy that we have definitely infiltrated into our own kind of ruling. And uh, of course, on the international and global humanitarian um, situation, what do we have to say about that? In terms of history, in terms of uh, the whatever jungle conflicts they have going on, I personally always have a strong stand against most of it because the way most of these countries have treated Africa, it's extremely bogus. You know, that's the word I'm going to use. So when we sit here and we try to do the same thing they keep doing when they say we are experts on the African soil, are they experts? No, they are not. And that is why we most times we sit there and argue with them and tell them, do not come on your own internet. And what, you've seen people fighting Western media because half the time they're spreading propaganda, half the time they're not telling the truth. You know, so when you sit actually, and all the time, actually, all the time, I was even reading an article today morning, and the way they are portraying Russia and this whole situation and Ukraine, it's disgusting. you can sit and see. And we all know, for example, from the beginning, NATO and the US have fueled this situation for a very long time. We've been watching it even on the internet. They put their, oh, oh my god, today Putin said, oh, and you can properly see that this is propaganda and they know exactly what it's going to lead to. So I would encourage most Africans, especially on most of these issues, the same way they keep treating you, start being bold. They know what they're doing. You know, when they attempt to say they're experts on your issues, are they experts? Or they come and get a whole civil perspective of whatever they're talking about and they plant it on you. And at the end of the road, that is what people are believing. So it's not about us sitting here and having a conversation of Ukraine, Russia. It's about what actually affects us as Africans and the way that we actually perceive most of these conversations. You know, it is a war that affects Africans, yes. But what is a perspective in which they affect us? Is it our is it our point to come and say, you know what, this war that you're having, yes, it is not uh, something that is ideal at the end of the day. But let me remind you, how many issues have you had in Africa? And they've called you savage. They have said, do you know what is happening on the African continent? Those savages are fighting. You saw how the media was reporting these issues a few minutes back. They're like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening in a first world country. People like the way it's always happening in Africa. Mm. Do you see that perspective of how they treat you? But then when it's time for you to talk about issues on Ukraine, Russia, Simania Paris is burning, you come, oh, let's pray for Paris, let's pray for Ukraine. Why are you praying? Why are you praying at the end of the day? They have never prayed for you and they do not even care. He talked about the racism that most of the Africans have been facing in that country. That is something I would strongly want to talk about. Why do you tell us the it hypocrisy. is a humanitarian issue and then you tell us Africans are like third world citizens in the country and they should be the last to be rescued? Why? If it's a humanitarian crisis, why aren't you rescuing everyone? Why are they on the borders begging, freezing? There was a video of a woman with a three-month-old baby freezing at the border between Ukraine and Poland. And guess what? The Polish said, no, the issue is not on our end. Ukrainian soldiers have refused Africans to cross over. That is the issue you should be talking about. Their history, their what? I'm honestly going to tell you right now, me as an African, I am tired. I am no longer going to speak for Caucasians. The issue they are having, let them fight and finish. When all this is done, Africans, let's come up with the solutions that actually affect us and help us and we see a way forward. In terms of the what they are having, humble opinion, baby male. Okay. <laughs> humble opinion, let them finish. Before you, okay. uh, I want to refresh my sister's uh, memory that uh, whatever happens to Russia and the, between Russia and the United States or the communist side, directly and indirectly affect Africa. That is what, what, what I was coming that to. Is, Absolutely. Not... Even, even the, 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 their the historicity history. mm -hmm. and the political genesis, economic, absolutely <laughs> affects Africa because 
like you said, we just transplanted mm -hmm. the democratic path, uh, the economic path, mm -hmm. even our even our, what what gives us capacity, slowly, 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 our military power, and also the capacity for us to make decisions mm -hmm. entirely depends on 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 what the global scale mm -hmm. is is doing, and it is very very hard to say. We delink completely from 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 those what from that happening? crisis. It is very very difficult. Very, I, very I, difficult. Uh, I okay, think sorry. she's not. I think she's not saying we are delinked. No, and mm. delinking. She's sorry. she's actually really concerned about the issues. What she is saying is, what for example, we we cannot sit here and do a descriptive of history. We have read all these books and all these mm. things. We cannot talk about Russia and Ukraine like a description. Mm. We should actually think very surgically about what are the opportunities now for Africa in this situation. For example, there has been a lot of hypocrisy. You know, there, these, are ref, these are not refugees. There are people with blue eyes and brown hair on Al Jazeera, BBC, CNN. <laughs> these are our chances. They should never again. Hmm? We should pick all these things as case studies for the next time they, something happens to Africa. They are sanctioning Russia. Uh, with all these sanctions. Africa is the most sanctioned place in the world. Thank you. We are living in sanctions. Do you know how much the world, the rich, the top 10 rich countries borrowed during COVID? $70 trillion. We borrowed $1.5 billion. And we have, they pay less than 3% interest on that $70 trillion. Mm -hmm. We borrowed $1.5 billion. We pay, uh, what's the interest rate charge? If you read the last budget, almost half of our budget is on paying interest 23 trillion. so while we are saying russia is being sanctioned you should know that us here we are the most sanctioned people in the world and if we don't start using these things to reflect on what happens here mm -hmm. you know then we lose out we cannot keep describing as if it's a telenovena yeah, yeah. But, yeah. okay sure. for the benefit of our viewers do you want to cite out some of the sanctions that uganda has, has had no it's an indirect thing you know they are sanctioning Russia. Russia has two types of sanctions happening. Mm. There are sanctions that are economical. You know, don't, don't, we are not importing this. For example, importing. are there countries in the world where Ugandan goods and products cannot be accepted? We are fighting over coffee. They have chased our yeah. coffee from, from, Germany has chased our coffee from, I mean, Europe has removed Uganda from the international. Actually, Uganda withdrew in rebellion. Mm. Then Europe said, okay, we are not buying your coffee. Do you know, you try to sell value-added coffee in Europe. Mm. And see the taxes. So the so world is is that as a result of the global market competition? No, it's or it is intentional and deliberate. Because we, we must distinguish between the two. Yes. Because if if we are selling coffee that isn't of you know quality, we have the best is, coffee that competes with the global quality. Then we have the best coffee, second best coffee so in the world. It is, it is unintentional. It is a deliberate sanction against our Africa was historically designated to be a source of raw materials if you if africa is supposed to produce i'm, I'm in the minerals world mm. if you go to places where there are minerals they are the poorest people in the world and the richest people in the world working next to each other mm. africa is designated to be like that get the goods as cheaply as possible and world trade organization all these organizations struggle to keep us in that space mm. you know and we don't have consumer protection we don't we are not protected in any way so while we are crying about Russian sanctions, we are... But, but uh, Sam, yes. is this a concern of the international community or it's our own making? Because I'll tell you that the United States introduced the smooth holy tariff mm. in around under Woodrow, sorry, under Woodrow Wilson yes. and, uh, and um, Alexander Hamilton yeah. as the Secretary of State. And the idea of the smooth holy tariff was to encourage the economy to be inward looking, mm. okay? Um, limit the importation of of um, of goods, but also subsidize, you know, um, utilities for the domestic manufacturers, and this encourages the economy to grow. Okay, so some of these economic decisions are actually inherent; they are generic. We take them as a country. So if we don't encourage our domestic companies to develop, and we don't support them, we don't build them, and at the end of the day, they produce half-baked products then whose problem is that moses we live in a a, a country is like a kettle mm. Mm? you may think it's it's the whole reality within there but it's not there's a whole world outside the kettle but because it's always heating mm. you think all the problems are being caused by yourselves can be solved by yourselves mm. 
But he has talked about the economic hitman. We are in a dead trap. <laughs> hmm? You cannot grow. You cannot get us. I've told you, we borrowed $1.5 billion. Mm. The rich, top 10 rich countries borrowed $70 trillion. Mm. I don't know if those numbers say something in your head. Mm. But these are things that we cannot control. Mm. And they have been put on us by the world out there. So when we're talking about Russian sanctions, I think we should also know that we are actually a very sanctioned place mm. and the sanctioned people. Yeah? So I think that's what she's emphasizing. Okay. Yeah. Professor Moses, let me take Fair you enough. back. Uh, you have talked about a global market, right? Mm. You have talked about uh, a whole continental um, kind of relationship. Then how do you come and tell me that he has even told you African Ugandan coffee is one of the best on the market right now? And actually, that is why you start questioning if the actual global market that we are talking about is a genuine thing or it is like a shell they are putting there to show that, yeah, we are doing the work, but, but you're actually not doing the wait, work. Is this a white man issue because even our neighbors here in mm -hmm. in Tanzania had issues with our maize mm -hmm. just just not so long ago. So are these are these white countries? That is, no no no. These are our neighbors who Moses, say please keep Moses, your maize with you. Moses. Okay. You have said so, at the end. You have said you uh -huh. have said countries are encouraging are encouraging inward you know Looking economic. So if you I want to take you to the point of the global market, mm. right? If you talk about a global market, the same way we're going to end up talking about a humanitarian situation that is actually coming from the most racist point of view I can even talk about. Mm. If you're going to talk about a global market, there are more things to it than just talking about a thing that is assuming mm. an importance and yet it's not working. If you say my maze has issues, on the global market, what are you supposed to do? Mm -hmm. If it has issues, then tell me the actual issue is this, Uganda improve on this and this, right? Why is it that when you're having issues, all the countries under the United Nations can sit and vote? But you can't say, let us maybe help them economically improve by doing A, B, C, D. And we see a way of importing more from them to us and the global markets than they are right now. Why do you say then, those are the products we don't need, but when it's time for war, let yeah. us all sit together and kumbaya. Can, can why? I, can okay. I support? Uh, I, I, no, okay. why? I want to bring I, Adeline. Okay, before, but one second. Uh, I don't know what she's saying. Uh, there is the issue of uh, class antagonism. Mm -hmm. Class struggles. Yes. Yeah, class mm. The bourgeois fighting the proletariat. proletariat. Mm. The rich is fighting to remain rich. Mm. And, and, and the poor also is struggling to Are clamoring to... <laughs> now, when you look at our exportation and you look at the contribution of coffee to Uganda's economy, I don't believe, I don't believe honestly speaking, especially with the, the people who are so, so much concerned with world affairs, that there is no day a rich person will allow you to develop, especially uh, using your, your power. Mm. If you have the best coffee, you know, now, uh, when this government came to power, there was bias against coffee. Mm. But because China was interested in our coffee so much, so much. Mm. Government said, it's okay, we can modify and, and have this actual coffee growing uh, transformed. But the reason he's saying is that the underlying issues, the political underlying issues, not actual real, real, real coffee. They're saying, okay, since Uganda is taking a political shift, mm. a political shift, from this side to this side, what are their technologies of power? What, where is the strength? The strength is in coffee, the strength is in peace, the strength is in what? Hence, the issues we are seeing. It is not about Kenya or Tanzania refusing our maids. No, no, no. It is the rich fighting the poor. Since, you, since Kidega Moses, you no, you're no longer friendly, you no longer greet me, you no longer give me milk, you no longer... You're no longer saying hi, I mean yes to whatever I say. Mm. You're now becoming an independent country. It is time to sanction you. It is time to weaken you. It is time to, since you have started seeing light, like you have seen, Libya was trying to see light. You saw uh, Ethiopia is, was trying to be very, very powerful. Mm. You see that they follow the Tigran war. You know what happened in Yemen, you know what happened in Afghanistan, you know what happened to Chuba, you know what... 
you know why actually North Korea is very, very strong? It is because of such issues. Even when, when I think that North Korea is the most sanctioned country, it remains the greatest. So as long as you don't tow the line of the capitalists, you're in trouble. If you don't want to be in trouble, or you, then you can, you can, you can. They will give you a market. They will give you. So, which line are we towing as a country? We shall discuss. Okay, okay. Um, fair enough. Let me come to. Uh, let me come to my neighbor on my immediate left. Um, Nachitenda, you belong to the to the Democratic Party, if I'm to say, and the Democratic Party is uh, a center right political party and your views are centered around democracy, humanitarian views and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, well, you've been quiet on this issue. I haven't seen your party leadership make a statement. At least I can attach the yeah, neutrality. At least I can attach the <laughs> at least I can attach the neutrality of our position as a country to the NRM government. Mm -hmm. But from the Democratic Party, from inside those circles do you think that this affects us as a country or we should just let it pass and, you know, ignore it and continue with our business? I mean, whatever happens there, it is their business. The refugee spillover, is the, it is their business. Because my thinking is that the world today is, is driven by agenda, okay? That the United States um, benefits so much from setting the agenda for the world to discuss. They bring up a controversial... Um, uh, uh, view of maybe LGBT, and the world will send their conversations around that. So it looks like Russia has set an agenda for the world to, to talk about, and here we are talking about Russia, Ukraine. Is it equally affecting the Democratic Party within your circles or you're your doing your own businesses? Well, I cannot say that the Democratic Party is so outside the entire globe, no. We are equally affected, but usually I want to think maybe we can concentrate on the economy. Yes, the economy could affect us. The rest are just lessons for us to learn from. Mm. And it is not particularly of interest that we should pronounce our interests to them. No. Mm. We can keep our interests, but watch them and learn from them. Mm. That is our time. And as Democratic Party, apart from the economy and the inflation that would otherwise spill over, I don't think we should interest ourselves. Okay. You have uh, continued not to interest yourself in that conversation. <laughs> yes, okay. non aligned mov movement. The fact that she's discussing then she's <laughs> Yeah, she's. <laughs> no, we are to be interesting as well, just to learn from you. Yes, okay. I agree with you. Non aligned. Okay, fair enough. Um, Yvonne, let me come to yes. you. This is your, your math, you know, the women's math, so I'll, I'll give you as much uh, time as possible. Um, Uganda has enjoyed a very conducive um, relationship with Russia. At least that I, have, I know from my little, you know, understanding. Mm -hmm. do, you do you think this in any way affects our relationship with them? In terms, of our, why... in terms of exporting our, our goods, in terms of what we get from them, mm -hmm. in terms of maybe the military, you know, uh, prowess that comes with our being closely attached or closely, you know. So yes. how does it affect us? Does this... Shall it stay the same between us and them, or it will mm. be business as usual? Well, uh, for one, I would think um, the fact that, you know, at the UN resolution to, to take a stand, you know, over the situation, the fact that we voted uh, to abstain was a bit smart, you know, because, like you've said, we have that sensitive position between us and Russia, and we've enjoyed a very wonderful, blossoming collaboration between the two countries. So at the end of the day, Uganda also has to be smart in terms of how it plays, you know. And like you said, at the end of the day, Russia is a, it's a superpower. So if you're already on the winning side, I'm not saying we are winning. I will not take that stand. But we already enjoyed that collaboration with them. And honestly, why it would be important for us to abstain in this regard, I'm going to say in that regard and bracket it, 
is that there's already that collaboration, there's already that um, global partnership between us and Russia, and the fact that, you know, I know that there are even just outside Uganda, there are so many other countries that import a lot of, for example, wheat from Russia and uh, fertilizers. I think Kenya, Kenya, mm. the neighbor here, is one of the biggest importers of uh, Russia's fertilizers. At the end of the day, you don't compromise that situation. You know, mm. you don't col compromise um, that collaboration, you don't compromise that partnership. And it is important, like we've been saying, for us to actually abstain and keep the conversation in that context because, one, we know that at the end of the day, when those superpowers start their issues in whichever regard, if it trickles down to us, it's us who suffer by the, the most, mm. it's Africa okay. that suffers the most on that, on that front. Sorry? All right, co continue. It's us that suffer the most. So much as, you know, I saw, because I was seeing on Twitter recently, um, after that UN resolution was drawn, and, you know, countries that uh, some had voted for, others are in the middle, others are completely saying, no, let the war continue. I was actually proud of Uganda to sit there and abstain, because on our front, you know, you're enjoying your collaboration, your partnership is fine. <laughs> we are going to be okay. realistic about these things, by the way. Fair enough. You're enjoying... Let me just bring some right there. Some, mm. she I says that see. Kenya you know, imports Russia's wheat to a very big scale. No, fertilizers, fertilizers you said. Yeah. To a very great scale. Mm -hmm. But Kenya went ahead to vote for, okay? Mm -hmm. Uganda, whereas, yes, we also enjoy a good, maybe blossoming relationship with Russia, mm -hmm. we abstained. What is the difference be between the two countries? No, I mean, if you... There was a, a, a CIA dossier that was, that was released about our president, number one. I think it was the early 90s when they had just taken over, saying one for whom, one who is open mm. to Western ideas and neoliberal options, mm. but one for whom aid does not mean obvious loyalty. Mm. So, <laughs> one for whom aid does not mean obvious loyalty. Okay. So, I mean, we have a very smart president who knows how to go about some of the issues. Mm. I think, you know, power games. Power is different from politics, and there are a lot of dynamics. You may find, you know, Kenya is, 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 is negotiating for something at the moment. You may find Uganda is... It's, it's a very... Power games are power games, mm. and they're very dynamic. They follow their own laws. There's no morality mm. in that space. So it's no surprise that Kenya can import Russian fertilizers, but vote against them. Mm. However, um, she was bringing about some... I mean, you asked about uh, how Russian, this Russian issue may affect us. We, we actually, if you, if you read the U.S. De uh, Defense Department statistics, mm. the biggest dealer of second-hand second arms in Africa is Ukraine. So <laughs> we should know that all these donations going to Ukraine in terms of guns, mm. Kalashinovs, and all this, they eventually end up in Karamoja. In fact, we are working on an article called how the Ukraine-Russia war affects Karamoja. Mm. Because where do those guns come from? Hmm? So where do the guns in Tigray mm. come from? Where do the guns in Eastern Congo come from? Oh, Ukraine is statistically the biggest donor, actually the biggest dealer of second-hand arms. Mm. Mm. And the war is going to end. This is a surgical war. It's not going to destroy Ukraine. So very soon, those weapons have to go somewhere because these weapons are made by companies and they need to be sold and resold. So in a nutshell, we we are entangled in this one way or another and that is what we began by saying yeah we we, we will always be entangled in one way or the other but we have it's beautiful to discuss bringing it down to our because mm -hmm. me and you are from the same area mm. we are from acholi we are currently being <laughs> rustled by by Karimojong, that, that you know we, ha we are facing a crisis of cultural wrestling mm. and there's a big government operation to stop it. But should we trace those guns? Where do they come from? They come from Ukraine. So it's important <laughs> to talk about. <laughs> it's important to talk about these conversations, <laughs> but in in ways that affect us. Yeah. Because my village was attacked. My village this year. Yeah. Yeah. Moses, before because he finishes. Fair oh, enough. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, it was. So, like he has said, um, at the end of the day, why there's much of a compromising situation for us. Um, recently, I was seeing someone saying, uh, you know, some of our leaders are afraid of taking us out. And of course, this is me uh, diverting a little bit from what I had said earlier mm. in terms of a collaboration that we have with uh, Russia. Uh, they have said that, you know, most leaders are in that comfortable position because a lot of Western powers have 
you know, powered them like that. You know, much as you will have in these relationships and whatnot, they're coming and injecting you with money to buy <laughs> the weapons you're using to beat people on the streets, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. people are also coming up and saying, much as you're abstaining and it seems like a smart diplomatic move, mm -hmm. it also uh, makes a strong point for you to say, in terms of in terms of what superpowers have actually done to what I'll call mm -hmm. us subordinate countries, mm -hmm. I will not really put ourselves in that brand, but that mm -hmm. is what they call us. In terms of how they view that conversation, is it that, you know, you're staying neutral because you're benefiting in that kind of way and, you know, mm. at the end of the day, your citizens are suffering here on yeah. the ground and you can't really take that stand yeah. and say, ah, I or, can't deal with Russia. Or you simply don't want to mend affairs. Simply, no, better, I think there's always... <laughs> All right. Okay, because I, I don't want us to, um, to base our arguments on, uh, on assumptions, but yeah. rather, you know, hinge them towards facts. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Ndugu Maxon, you had something to, to say? Yeah, uh, on the issue of uh, Sam, mm -hmm. you asked him the difference between Kenya and Uganda. Yeah. Uh, on the one took a stand yeah, 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 and yeah. one did not. Yeah, yet. Mm -hmm. uh, historically, Kenya was built as a white settler. Mm. And Uganda is, was a, typically a colony, mm. just repatriate and take. Yeah. Mm. Mm. But historically, the whites wanted to really settle in Kenya. Mm. It also defines why uh, mm -hmm. Kenya's economy, the 70% are in the, in the hands of whites, mm. the white man. You, have, you know also facts of the military bases, Kenya, you saw uh, Obama coming to Kenya, and not because he has the, 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 the ancestry there, but because uh, Kenya, in my opinion, is not an independent country. Yeah. In my opinion, as an individual, yeah. it's not an independent country. So it is this kind of voting was informed by what we call interests. Exactly. Each country followed their interests. So the 70% of Kenya's economy being in the hands of whites absolutely spells. Do you want to qualify the word white? Western? Absolutely, Western? absolutely. Western. Absolutely, absolutely. So absolutely. British does, 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 yeah, does... The British, because does, you know Kenya was in hands of, 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 the, of the British. So does mm. that then put an indictment mm. on your initial... Um, submission. Mm, why you say that Russia is the superpower, and you know it is, it is, it is, it is a growing nuclear superpower. Yeah, it is, it is it, a growing hegemony. It is. And now here is. you are saying that mm. this voting was based on interest. So if you go by the numbers of the vote, it looks like the West. No, 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 no. Of course, uh, like like he said, someone can give you aid, but giving me aid doesn't necessarily mean that you control me. There is also where you give me aid and you control me. How do how does the Western uh, uh, dispense aid? Mm. International Monetary Fund, mm. the World Bank, you said, and other technologies of power. Now they have added football, mm. Mm. world football. You're bad from playing this game. You're bad from playing this Judo. game. Now much as much as there is that trade between between Kenya and 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 the, and and, the, and and Russia. Mm. I can tell you the biggest portion, the biggest portion still remains in the West. So it is... Uh, yeah, it is, sh sure. So mm. you're saying that mm. some of these countries that either abstained or reported against did mm. not do what our lawyers would call quid pro quo, something for something. No, no, back, not at all, not I at all. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is about interest. For yeah, example, interest, Uganda, yeah. for example, Uganda, like I said, as the case of the NRM, it is peace. Mm. Abstinence means we want peace, period. Mm. Others can discuss the undertones of uh, Uganda is pro-Russia, but what the path that we took communicates peace, a yeah. peaceful world. We don't want to hear issues of Russia or America. We want peace. Period. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Also putting um, and all of us us. <laughs> who take part in the war. You said I'll come for all of it. <laughs> that, that, no, 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 that takes us to a short commercial break. That Thank was. you very much for keeping it on the youth round table. As we continue to have this conversation, please feel free to put your comment on the comment section. Let us know what you think. If you agree with any opinion, let us know. If you disagree, please give us your alternative opinion. Otherwise, we'll go for a short break and see you right after this break. Mm -hmm. 
Well, well, we'll be back from that short commercial break and thank you for keeping it the youth round table. Like I had told you, go ahead to put your comments on the comment section. Go ahead to subscribe to this channel so that you get weekly updates of our conversations. We shall continue right from where we stopped. We know that as of today, a couple of sanctions, more so economic, have been levied against Russia. We also know that so many big companies have withdrawn their capital from the Russian you know, economy. But also we know that if the broader economic sense is to be examined, Africa and Uganda at large will be affected. We know that Uganda and many other African countries get aid. Of course, Dambisa Moyo has told us how you know, foreign aid is actually dead aid, but we shall you know, look at this in the sense and lenses of Africa. Um, Sam, the economic misfit, and I will you know, channel the economic question to you right away. Um, we know that um, if the Russian economy is affected, in terms of uh, maybe all these big investments withdrawing the capital from, from Russia, one way or another will affect Russia's you know, um, financing of other countries that have been financing. And I think Uganda is not very far from that aid that has you know, been coming from Russia. Aid can be both you know, in kind, but also in terms of the tangible money in itself. So let's speak about the economy. You said earlier on that we rely so much on aid and about 43% of our budget is financed by foreign aid. So what does, where does this leave us in terms of the aid that we've been getting from, from the Western world and East as well? All right, thank you very much. First of all, uh, I, I, am, I, I read a lot about Russian approach, especially to our country. It's not, Russia tries its best to talk with us on level terms. They, they don't use aid the way the West does. Mm. I think the total investments from Russia and Uganda about less than $50 million. Uh, it's, that's a very big contrast to what Uganda gets from the West mm. and what, you know, uh, if, if just clean aid to Uganda mm. from the West is hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm. And when we look at that's even before the money that is paid to Uganda to do its mercenary work in Somalia and you know the billions that we receive in military mm. backing because of the regional peacekeeping that we do. Mm. So I think there's not a big uh, comparison in terms of in terms of that. But I would I would like us to when we talk about this issue of aid, I mean it hits me very passionately because for me I personally think Africa not even think the statistics to back this Africa sends over 400 billion dollars every year to the world so actually africa is the biggest aid giver in the world if you look at illicit cash flows i'm, I'm from the minerals world mm. so there's what we call illicit cash flows money that disappears out of the blue from unaccounted for coltan from all these places i mean genie where this guy was overthrown alpha conde alpha conde mm. there's a big um we, we we had some work there there's a big Chinese container in the sea, um, in the you know just a hundred or two hundred kilometers mm. from from Guinea. I think Guinea is the big is a big supplier of uh, al, I mean, what, what's this the raw product of aluminium. Um, uh, either, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure of it. So yeah. uh, what happens is China comes, got a deal from Conde, and even built their own port. How do you accept someone to build a port in your country? Mm. <laughs> they build their own port. It's bauxite. Yeah. So instead of picking bauxite, China picks the whole soil with gold, what, everything mm. they take to that, you know, container. Now, if you read the U.S. sources of bauxite, mm. China is one of the biggest. China has no bauxite. Mm. But that container in the sea is China, you know. So mm. there's a lot of ways that, that, that's what I mean by illicit cash, mm. you know. Money mm. that never gets accounted for. Okay. Yeah, so mm. we, we, we lose a lot. We need to be aware of things. Now that my friends are here, mm. I'd like to bring us issues. That Russia, the European Union, and China, the West, Japan, they're currently fighting for what we call critical minerals, critical to the emerging technologies. technologies. And Donald Trump listed 47 critical minerals, most of them are in Africa mm. and Congo. And we need to be alive to these things. Because we may be supporting Russia. For the, for the benefit you know, of our viewers, do you want to mention a few of them? Of those yeah, models? I mean, if you look at things like Coltan, things that are used to build like semiconductors, things that are going to power emerging technologies. Okay? 
So there's now a, 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 what would be like an arms race. Who is the first to secure this for the next 50 years? Mm -hmm. And Russia is a man. The West is a man. European Union is a man. So, when, we, when we're discussing some of these issues about aid and money going out, I think we should also be alive to, to what Africa is giving out, even to these people that we, we think we are, we are, we are, they are donating to us. Mm. Yeah, so that okay. is my yeah. depth, in-depth opinion. Okay, thank you. And uh, Yvonne, let me come to you. Sam has done us some justice in terms of uh, the economic perspective and how this affects us. Let me draw your mind on the legal perspective because I know that rule of law forms a bedrock for democracy and for how society is governed. For the, you know, the body, the body politic is one way or another anchored around rule of law. We have seen the International Criminal Court trying crimes against humanity. You know, our own Dominic Nguyen and Coelho and others have been tried in the ICC. And um, I saw the ICC prosecutor Karim Karim Khan said that they are going to begin investigations onto the crimes that you know Russia is allegedly have committed against the people of um, of Ukraine. Do you see this going any far or because Russia is part of the UN Security Council? Mm, sure. Do you think their presence there is going to influence even what will happen in the ICC or we expect the ICC to be as neutral and fair in terms of um, indicting I mean if they're found guilty indicting mm. or um, you know, acquainting and saying this was nothing. Mm. Well, so do you think they will treat African war crimes mm. okay, the same way they will treat this if it is a crime against humanity? Mm -hmm. Actually, thank you for rephrasing it to yeah. that. Because I think in terms, of, um, in terms of how a lot of these bodies assume or pretend to, I won't say pretend because at the end of the day we are going to follow this investigation until a point of no return and realize they were just taking us for a ride. Okay. And uh, we realize that most of the times, a lot of these bodies are put up just to keep Africa in the position that we're earlier talking about, you mm. know. Um, I honestly do not think ICC is going to do the justice they tell us they're going to do, to be honest with you. Um, I, Russia is a superpower. Mm. Even before them sitting on the UN cars, even before them sitting, it's a superpower. Okay. How many other atrocities are we talking about in terms of what the West has done? Mm. And none of them has ever been sanctioned. Mm. None of them has, has ever been summoned. Was, was uh, Obama summoned for what he did in Libya? No. They didn't even talk about it. They made it seem like it's a small... P point of information. Sure. Sure. Okay. There's, there's actually a, an act in the US called Bomb the Hague Act. So... <laughs> <laughs> by any means necessary, <laughs> uh, if a U.S. citizen is taken mm. to the Hague, they have all rights to use any means necessary to mm. take them out. Mm. So oh, that's ICC for you. Mm. Very interesting. Very Bomb interesting. the so, Hague. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting. Very so interesting. I think if we are to be realistic with ourselves, and especially us as Africans, I'm not going to speak for Russians because I genuinely do not think... ISIS mm. is going to do much. Okay. Uh, they are just backing dogs, like you said earlier, <laughs> the mm. way NATO has been backing from the beginning of the whole situation till now. I think ISIS is doing the same thing. They are just backing because at the end of the day, Russia is a superpower. Mm. There's nothing you're going to do to them. You mm. can't tell me that ISIS actually has that power to sanction Putin and he comes and he's someone that he enters there to be, to be what is it called? To so, be so, so ICC and UN only come for the small fish. They come and for the small <laughs> fish because even the way they've been set up, they've Dominic been set Ongwen. up by the very mm. powers that are telling us, you know, at the end of the day, you're going. What are you going to investigate about Putin, honestly? So, well, knowing that, should we continue paying our allegiance, or should we even continue to be a member of such international no. organizations? Which, or it's high time we took a radical position and said, well, to we, hell with this. And I agree. We need I'm an African very glad. I'm person. very glad you've taken us to the radical point, because even mm. the minute I opened this conversation, I said Africa needs to become bold in terms of how they make their decisions. Mm. Several times they are calling your presidents, they are calling your leaders, okay, much as we have our internal issues going on, mm. they are the small fish that they can sanction and summon any other day, right? Mm. But when it comes to these big powers, they are, why are you doing an investigation? How many investigations have they done here before they, they summon your presidents and whatnot? Very few, you know? They will throw your sanction at you before you even say anything, and that's it. It's final. But then you're telling us, a person who has actually gone ahead and bombed the whole country, you're telling us you're going to do investigations. What are you investigating? Mm, mm, mm. So do you see how they just put an umbrella of a whole justice system and they're telling us the thing is actually working, yet it's not? Fair enough. Thank it you. doesn't work. Thank you. Uh, Ndugu Maxon, um, 
President Uhuru Kenyatta was actually, you know, mm -hmm. uh, sanctioned to the ICC yeah. for the 2007, mm -hmm. you know, post-election violence that happened in Kenya. And you're someone at the time when I think I was already a sitting president, if mm -hmm. I'm, you know, if I have the facts right. So it looks like these international bodies uh, don't see African states as, as in, in equal measure. You know, they sanction us at, uh, at, at will, whereas exonerate the biggest crime committers. What's your own opinion? I, I talked about uh, uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman mm -hmm. by John Parkins. Mm -hmm. The new edition is called The New Confessions of an Economic Hitman. After here, all of us can interest ourselves in that book. Uh, part of the technologies of power the global empire uses is the International Criminal Court. Like I said, I am with the World Bank to deal with statistics and uh, also push some aid to some countries that are really not doing well. Then they hold those countries at ransom. Then they use such like International Criminal Court to indict people that are even innocent or even are not supposed to be. So it is... Uh, it is it is simply a technology of power. Mm. The West. They just use it as it's a, a walking stick, yeah, mm. uh, 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 to to make uh, political negotiations to gain uh, capacity, but also to 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 impose uh, coloniality on on, on 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 weak nations. But uh, wholesomely, Africa is on a plate, and uh, the West and East are eating. There's a lot of competition. You all know, I am I'm glad Sam is in, in mineral world. You know, 60% of world uh, minerals are here in Africa. And uh, these are superpower and growing countries, which only require minerals for production, to make uh, goods, to uh, assemble a huge military hardware and deadly weapons, so what they need is simply minerals. Where are the minerals? In Africa. So how do they get minerals? There are different approaches. Mm. Strength, if they refuse to give us minerals, overthrow countries, install pseudo-kings, mm. those pseudo-kings will be easy. Mm. They'll say, we want gold, okay, you get. As long as you can give me a house, you can get, give me power, you can, give, you can build some airports around, mm. that is... Others will come with negotiation, like you were saying, mm. different approaches. They are not interested in internal politics of different countries. Mm. They are only interested in minerals, but through negotiation. Mm. Others will come and say, we want to build roads. We want to help you build this. We want to train your aim. We want to. Then you give us minerals, just like China is, saying, is, is doing. You get what I'm saying? Mm. So here in this particular case, this Ukrainian war should give us a lesson that this is the right time for Africa to integrate. One, for strategic security. Two, for common market. Three, for negotiation. That if you're strong, there is no country whatsoever that can come and intimidate you. But look, we are still discussing opening the border. We are still discussing issues of maize between, Rwanda, between Uganda and Kenya and Tanzania. There are countries, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, and others that are still actually listening to what France says. Mm. Then there are countries that are absolutely in bed with, with Russia. There are countries that are in, in, in bed with, with the Americans. They are count so Africa is, is, is disjointed. Mm. This is the only time, because yeah, we are going I to trust. face the commonalities of, 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 of economy. Like he said, we are going to borrow more. We have just come from COVID. We are going to borrow. Now we are depending on production on what we export outside. Actually, even if Russia, even if we don't export to Russia, but what we have been exporting to Russia goes through some country before it reaches. Now Russia is sanctioned. So we are going to see oil hiking, fuel prices. Mm. The, the, the crisis is going to, to affect the, the, the education. You have seen students crying, African students crying. We have students here 
who are, who are from here and they are in, in Russia and, and, and Ukraine, you have, you have military students there. You, you, yeah. have, you, you have also, uh, uh, like, like you said, like uh, my sister said here, who are exporting a lot from, from, from Russia, especially fertilizers and the wheat and other things. Now, all of that is going to, to go to the gridlock. But you can only recover from that if you have capacity to produce yours. Mm. Unfortunately, we don't. We don't. But um, speaking of capacity, Bukumakson, um, I remember when President Kagame, with due respect, was chairing the African Union. Mm. We passed what we called uh, the East African Free Trade Treaty. And he was chairman at the mm -hmm. time when we signed that treaty. But a few months later, he closed... His, yeah, yeah. His, his it, it, so it, it, the political will for African it, it, heads it, it, of it, it, it is what I'm saying. Is, it is what I'm is saying. Lacking. That there is there is someone up there who is playing a supervisory role mm. to make sure that Africa is not united. I don't it's think that people are there. They will appreciate when we are strong. When we are strong, it means we are independent. Mm. Independence means that Africa can take a decision. Without any influence, you will see AU. It is a backing door, isn't it? Yeah, Nothing. But, yeah. So there are people that cannot allow integration of Africa and integration of, of, of East Africa. So I am not surprised that some people are are, uh, are, are praying to the interests of other people and and hence. Yeah. Let me just um, support your argument. Mm. I have listened to a military officer sometimes speak and. He discussed the concept of strategic depth. Absolutely. That can you imagine if, for example, East Africa was one country and the capital city was Kampala and the first border point was maybe at the border of DRC Congo and maybe mm, Sudan mm, and mm. all that. Yeah, that's, that's the strategic if, depth. If East Africa as a country was attacked, it would take a longer time for the capital Absolutely. Kampala to be attacked. No, 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 you is in bring it to Rwanda. Depth. Bring it in <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, strategic depth. Mm. Bring it to Rwanda. By the time R Rwanda reaches Kampala, yes. for us, we have already advanced to Kigali. That is true. Okay, fair enough. Um, <laughs> let me come back to you, <laughs> Nachitende. Yes, sir. Um, the NRM government, of course, through our, our permanent diplomat to the, to the United Nations, Adonia, we abstained from this uh, you know, UN resolution. You're from an opposition political party. Mm. Assuming you are the party in power, what decision could you have taken? Or you agree with the position and, and smart move of the NRM? Very correct. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for that question. Uh, well, abstinence is the best for now. So even DP would have abstained? So you agree with NRM? You have no option. It's not that we do not have an option. <laughs> but usually, the politics has a point where you have to reach and then you have a consensus. Mm. You know? So, at that point, we agree it is best for us to abstain mm. because it favors us. It is the best position for our country to abstain. So, in other words, the country is being led well by the, the NRM. I do not so want far. to say we do not have our grievances as yeah. a country. Yeah. Our internal politics, we have our own grievances. Okay. But at that point, yeah. we NRM agree well. it was a good position. Okay. Very good. Very good. Congratulations. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Congratulations uh, to the NRM no, for, no, no. No, for it was even a appealing. Good position. Very for, good. Yeah. For Very even good. appealing. You give credit where I, I, I hope they record it. Yeah, yeah sure, yeah. sure. Very good. We give credit where She's on record. <laughs> yeah, she's on record. Uh, well, now, comrades, let's move to the end of this particular conversation before we shift gears slightly to uh, digital rights. Shall spare the next, the last ten minutes of it. Just get your opinion about digital rights. But uh, let me get your last words regarding um, the Russia-Ukraine crisis. What it means for Africa, but what it means for Uganda as a country. So let me begin from Yvonne. Okay. Then um, I'll come to Sam. Then Comrade Maxon. Then um, GP. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so in terms of what it means to us or in terms of uh, the impacts that we have diversely discussed here, 
um, economic, and of course, uh, there are a bit of social um, issues that we've raised as well. Um, like we've said, we've abstained from, you know, voting on whether, you know, this is something that we should go ahead with and take aside. Or, uh, but I would think um, I would divert a little bit, and I think I diverted a little earlier because in terms of as citizens, there's a cause for worry, mm. you know. Is it that uh, we're abstaining because we are benefiting in a certain way that is mostly uh, political? And I think I use... Uh, now that we're going into digital rights, we're going to have a very big conversation, much as it may not be big, yeah. on uh, abuse of power here in Uganda. Mm. You know, so I think when citizens start worrying that you know, if you're taking an abstinence stand, it's maybe because you are you're endorsing that kind of violence. Mm. You know, are you endorsing that kind of violence that it's okay for a country like Russia to go ahead and you know destabilize another country simply based off certain reasons, or is it something that we have to worry down here as well? Because you know, like I had mentioned earlier, these are people that are funding a few human rights abuses even here in Uganda. So in terms of the citizens, there's a need to worry. But I would think that in terms of the UK, uh, sorry, Ukraine or uh, Russia crisis, uh, I know they have a, an Atlantic. Uh, I think an Atlantic trans Atlantic. Uh, 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 Security Alliance uh, as a whole Western umbrella under the European Union and whatnot. So if they are to resolve anything in terms of security, I know that that alliance plays a very big role outside NATO and whatever. It plays a very big role in terms of how they settle most of their issues. And I think that's why it was not even like in our place to really comment largely mm. in terms of uh, the crisis that is going on. But also as Africa, I think this is a very big opportunity for us because they've showed us where the gaps are we are still exporting so much and we don't realize that, you know, if we went ahead and became smart enough to start producing, for example, a lot of what we're exporting from outside or, wait, sorry, importing, importing yeah. from outside, then would actually become, you know, would go to that level where we become comfortable in terms of even not negotiating certain things at those negotiation tables with our superpowers. Uh, so I think there's a very, very big opportunity for us to actually start looking inwards. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, we were talking about um, the African Union also being a backing dog. But <laughs> look at the position they are in, you know. Mm -hmm. On top of having their resolutions, I think one of their articles uh, 4 is on peace and security. Yeah. And they want to achieve that by 2063. Uh, there was a big issue in terms of, and I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to conclude. There was a big issue in terms of, uh, you know, the fact that Africans were on these grounds and there was no one to help. Because we have all these bodies and they're just backing dogs and they're not doing anything. Mm. If the African Union could play its role, I do not think any African that was stuck in Ukraine should have been stuck there. Yeah. You know? If their resolutions are, you know, to help Africans generally on the continent, make sure you have actual measures for how to evacuate people safely, the same way some of those powers do. Why don't we learn those lessons? You know? So there's a very big opportunity for us to actually learn, like my sister said. We need to actually now become radical, we need to become bold, we take our own stance and say, you know what, from today, much as some of these issues may affect us, this is a stand we are taking, and it's purely, purely for the interests of Africa. Okay, thank you. Fair enough. Comrade Sam. Uh, thank you very much. She has, she has summarized almost everything. Yeah. I'll just reiterate the words of Bob Marley. Mm -hmm. Have no fear for atomic energy, because none of them can stop the time. Mm -hmm. I'll take the optimistic side. I don't think there will be a World War Three. I think the way of life that we have built in this civilization is quite fun, nice. People enjoy New York. They don't want it nuked. <laughs> Los Angeles, they Moscow. don't want it nuked. They don't want Moscow <laughs> nuked, you know. Yeah. We have a good, we have a relatively nice way of life, civilization that I think, uh, and I hope that Putin maintains the operations as surgical as possible. <laughs> and I hope that there's a negotiation that neutralizes, uh, you know, Ukraine because the West should stop these provocative, uh, you know, mm. ways. Then covering it up with propaganda. Mm. Putin should also know that, like Fukuyama said, the triumph of neoliberalism. You can't force yourself on people who don't like you. Mm. Mm? There's no consent. Mm. So, yeah, that's 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 my optimistic view. But on the African side, I want you to know that. Uh, I want us to maintain the spirit of the Bandang Conference mm. of our forefathers. Let's stay non-aligned, let's stay focused. The, the Ukraine you're supporting, those guns are going to end up here. You know, they will keep taking 
raw materials to make new guns mm. and we'll end up in in this cycle of poverty and you know so let us wake up mm. the world is moving fast so fast that uh, in in the minerals world they're now developing synthetic minerals synthetic diamonds synthetic gold because they're saying one day africa is going to rise Mm. and stop selling to us diamonds. Mm. So mm. let us start making them in laboratories. Mm. So let's pick up. Let's pick up pace. Let's move hard. And I think let's stay optimistic. But most importantly, mm. Africans, we should wake up and very quickly. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, much tender. Well, thank you. Uh, the Russia-Ukraine crisis, still affects us as Africa. But in the aspect that we are affected, it should be a call to us as Africans to stand up, to wake up from slumber, to know that we need ourselves united. We, need, we are better united than ever before. And I, want, I also want to state clearly that our move to abstain is a perfect move. Not because we as Ugandans don't have our internal problem with the government, but because it is surely the best move for now. And I still uphold the fact that we still need to be united. Problems are so Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Ndugu Maxon. Thank you. I am really uh, excited with the discussion of, of my colleagues. Uh, Africa is now a continent of 1.3 billion people, which is not uh, integrated in, term, in terms of market. And the, the Western world is talking about the five dimensional superiority. Mm. Space, air, land, water, and now they have added ICT. We are not superior in any of the five. We are only superior in conflicts and disintegration. The only lesson we learn, all lessons we learn from this crisis, is to wake up. One, COVID taught us to wake up and integrate. That even, even if you don't get an opportunity to export to the sanctioned countries or to the countries that are uh, receiving this crisis, at least you have an opportunity to export within yourself. That's, we talk, that's what we talk about, com, uh, common market. But also it gives us a chance to build our own security strength, the security capacity, strategic security, that in case of any confrontations, Africa is, is able to, to, to respond very, very critically. But also to give our leaders a lesson that you can lead people, no problem. Anyone can be president. But if you take miscalculations, you're going to cost the entire region, you cost the whole country, and civilians at large. Right now, we see, like I said, 1.5, 1.3 refugees. I'm hearing the, ref the word refugee in Europe for the first time in so many years. Refugees. They only talk about Africa, refugees in Africa, refugees. I'm now glad that they have seen. I'm not happy. I'm not trying to justify war. But at least they are now understand the meaning and magnitude of what a refugee means. So a president of being a leader, being an African leader at any level, let it be in the NRM or, or otherwise, that when you want to make a mistake or miscalculation, or you just listen to people simply because they give you some water, they give you some, some, some pocket change, you make miscalculations. It means you're going to cost the entire region. Zelensky, uh, listen, trying to listen to the West. Now you see he's, he has cost, he's costing the entire These country. The, the, the civilians are dying. I have heard now reports of dead bodies on streets. And Russia is still advancing. So it is very, very unfortunate. And we can only as Africa, only as Africa, learn from this. And the lessons I mentioned strategic security, common market, but also working very hard to overcome such crises. Wow, amazing. Um, fair enough. Uh, that brings us to the end of this particular conversation, and I must appreciate you all for your opinions. Mm. And my, what I pick in summary from what you've said are the words of Kwame Nkrumah, that Africa must unite if we are to 
advance economically, socially, but also above all, politically. Well, let us shift gears. Those of you who drive manual cars, you know that time comes and you <laughs> shift a gear. So let's shift gears to um, the last 10 minutes of our conversation, which is around, sorry, About digital. Motorcycles. Sorry? Motorcycles. Yeah, motorcycles as well, they have gears. <laughs> so <laughs> let's shift gears to uh, digital rights, and we shall spare only 10 minutes for this. Let me begin with you, Sam. Chapter 4 of our constitution is about human rights and all those things. Do we have rights? Do we have digital rights in Uganda from a legal perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, digital rights are not anything special. It's just a new way of self-expression okay. that comes with very many opportunities. I think we have now 40% internet penetration in Uganda, which mm. is very impressive. Mm. We thank all the people who are working hard towards that. And digitalization of our, of our country is, is a chance for new opportunities for economic transformation, checking on government. Basically, it enhances the social contract mm. that we are supposed to have from, from gov I mean, me, with, w between us and our leaders, you know. Yeah. And I'll leave, I'll leave it to my friends to go deeper into, uh, you know, what the opinions are on the on left or right. But <coughs> I've, I've seen the government approaching this digital uh, digitalization of our country in mm. two ways. Okay. From a legal perspective, it starts when Uganda was nuked in 2010, Al-Shabaab, we passed a law, Interception of Communications Act, mm. you know, that the government set up, a, is it a command, I mean, something center, forgetting mm. it, uh, where they are able to intercept these communications. Then the next year, we saw the Computer Misuse Act 2011, you know, um, still along the directions of limiting this digital space or trying to control it. Mm. I think in 2015, we saw the Registrations of Persons Act that mm. pull off, put all of us in, in the government system. Mm. Uh, all those were a bit limiting. Mm. Yeah. And then currently, we are also seeing um, a government sponsored, I mean, it's a private member's bill. But uh, we can definitely tell where it's coming from. Trying to add punishments, heavy punishments, to the original Computer Misuse Act. Mm -hmm. On the positive side, Uganda has put out the Data Privacy Act. I think it has been amended again. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the first African countries to do this. So we are quite protected in terms of, of data. Can be, a lot can be done better. But I think so that's, far. So far you're in the good. that's a good, very, very good direction because privacy is important. And it gives us a platform on which to check government, check a lot of these institutions. And I think I want to, the, the digital space will keep growing. I think it, we have a good framework of laws. Even the Computer Misuse Act, the problem is the, polit, I mean the, the political culture, the rule of law culture. Mm. You see, most of these acts are for you know, national security, rightfully so. However, however when the political environment is not held, the rule of law, you know, yeah. from constitutional law, that rule of law is a culture that we all live with. If we mm. say we are all going to dress in a certain way and we keep it, no one is going to punish you, but you have to live by it. Okay. So I would like to, I just wanted to give a legal structure. Mm. I believe my friends are more enthused to put in emotions. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Um, Yvonne, let me give you two minutes to give us your opinion about digital rights. Um, I'm definitely going to go towards the angle of the human rights, uh, especially the defending part, uh, mostly because I'm a representative of civil society, civil society yeah. but also he has given a very extensive legal background, background. too. Um, I think it's not even news to us anymore. <laughs> and I know my colleague here is already smiling because he knows where I'm about to go. Um, <laughs> it's no longer news to us when no, we just see following your voice. <laughs> when we see certain um, <laughs> and I won't say directly, um, human rights abuses in terms of um, the digital spaces that a lot of citizens are trying to occupy. You know, it has become a very serious conversation uh, because <laughs> the mere fact that very small comments on platforms, social media platforms like Twitter get you tortured to an extent of... We saw a gentleman recently, Kakwenza, mm. 
you know, it was a bit worrying that, you know, um, our leadership is taking uh, that kind of uh, direction in terms of uh, the misuse of digital digital rights in Uganda. And I would want that, you know, for us not to end up in such a rabbit hole where people are being put in a corner because we are going, we are genuinely going to a whole digital revolution, you know, not just as a country, but it's a global thing, you know. This is where trade is happening. This is where communication is taking the biggest space. This is where literally everything is going online. Literally everything is taking a digital stand. Mm. So if we start seeing atrocities like human rights abuses where you're torturing someone for very simple comments, I'll call them simple because honestly, if someone told me such things, I wouldn't be bothered like that. You know, you're, you're using that kind of platform that is supposed to be empowering your citizens and you're using it to abuse their rights and yet you have a whole supreme law that is giving them a whole diverse range of human rights and you're the very leader that is going behind and you're using it to actually, you know, um, try and stamp upon your citizens, then we have a reason to worry. So I would say that much as we're making a lot of progress in terms of a policy, in terms of reforms, there's a huge worry in terms of uh, human rights because it doesn't even just stop at citizens, even civil society has been complaining because the fact that, you know, they are taking a stand on certain issues, they are going to their offices and closing them, stealing their computers to steal data. You know, it has become a whole range of something that I think has to be discussed, you know. So at the end of the day, we are having all those advantages, but we have to look into the fact that, you know, it's also being used in the wrong way yeah. in terms of that progression. Yeah. Maxon. From the yellow corner, so many accusations from mm -hmm. from our comrades. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say about they have, digital rights? They have tried to accuse. <laughs> but uh, first of all, as a, as a file member of, of, of the National States Movement, torture, like she says, is not the policy of the government. Neither is it uh, the policy of the state. But this is like when you're walking and you knock your foot on, on the stone. Uh, it doesn't mean that you stop moving. Mm. Yeah, those are individual mistakes. And like history has been, whenever those mistakes are made, people are brought to book, investigations are going on. Like the president has always delineated uh, that uh, torture is not necessary. It is backward just because someone has aired the view. But what I wanted to say, like you said, chapter four talks about liberty, you know, uh, uh, civil liberties and freedom and, and rights. But it also says that as you enjoy your freedom, your liberty, please do not encroach or infringe on the rights of other people. Mm. Our moral fabric, we, have, we are using development of, of digital revolution, like she said as a security blanket to cover the trampling moral fabric. The moral fabric has trampled to the extent that we no longer think that insulting her is, not, is, mm. is, not, is, is, is very bad. Okay. That insulting him <coughs> is very bad. Mm. I don't know any country in the world that has developed because of insult or because of abuse. I don't know it. So I would want before someone blames to first do the decorum, like you say, that mm. this is bad, torture is bad, uh, approach was very bad, but on the other hand, this was not right. You have no right to abuse me. You have no right to insult, mm. and you go away. Just like I have no right to torture you, mm. isn't it? So, much as we, we enjoy rights, but we also need to remember that they are duties mm. of citizens, yeah. isn't it? So I, I, I want to, to, to appreciate the fact that uh, over 12 million uh, internet users in Uganda have freedom <coughs> to hear what they want to speak. If you know, for instance, that we don't have any opposition member that is in, in, in jail since 1986. Uh, All of them, they do whatever they want, they write whatever they want. We have more than... A, uh, 300 radio stations, they host opposition and pro-government officials, they talk what they want, mm. go on TV and speak what you want, you go. But it doesn't mean that we don't have a government. Having a government means that it is, it is, it is a group of people that makes but also implements policy, so that we don't have a jungle. Mm. 
anake weka wake up in the morning you do what you want to do you wake up in the morning you you, you speak against the team you lie you abuse then you go away then there is no importance of the state the state must come but it must fact. come in to, to address the issue of class antagonism I, I, I'd, i'd just like to chip in something since you you're part of the state the state you're also part of the state <laughs> yes I'm, i'm part of the state <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Part population of... is part of the state so here's the thing you you as as the people around the country you have Oh, we have a role to socially engineer you know the way we want our people to think we are supposed to be active citizens when we turn 18 with capacity to vote and all these things but between 0 to 18 they simply know civics and nowadays civics has grown into things like social media for example i met a very interesting professor who told me you can say anything on social media who was that like one, one of I'm, i'm i'm he's called or or don't i mean or caught something that like that is a kenya mm. just just yes <laughs> yes is a material but he told me you can say anything on 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 online as long as you can do the same in real life that's the principle mm. Mm. and he told me that's just one thing there is a series of social media civics but even civic culture in general that's the rule of law that we're talking about so i think the state has done a very big you know in in law we call it an omission in in eliminating civics in general and even contemporary civics like social media before you come and say but we don't even know the other people's rights that were supposed to infringe on we are not told to to to, to respond you know to, to uh, uh, respond. it's 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 a uh, i get i get yes, what you're yes, saying yes. i get what you're saying you know the the digital rights are part of the third generation and fourth generation rights right mm -hmm. I'm, i'm 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 very accurate about that that we have what we call values principles of society before we go to civics before we go to digital we go to their values they might not be written Which society every 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 society every community in the world every family every community every society every country has what they call culture and also values what uganda does in have values it has it no has. we don't have a ugandan culture uh, it is it is let me come i'm i'm coming listen mm. our culture maybe if you're not african but our culture is that you gain nothing in insulting and abusing or fighting they might not be written somewhere but those are principles and values that govern society right just like the us don't have a written constitution we also know we also know that you gain nothing in attacking her don't mind about the repercussions because that's when we go to to the law but before we go to the law before we go to civics before they have values and principles that actually you as an individual must undertake or must understand as an individual that you're walking you're not supposed to spit there mm. you're not supposed to 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 urinate there you're not supposed to uh, to fight kidega just because you think you should you get those are values that have guided african society and its people you get so before mm. before we go to <coughs> torture and others that we think torture is not important but we must ask ourselves what is the level of our moral fabric as africans but also as a people as we close off i might ask what do you gain in insulting me with yeah fair enough i think <laughs> just just to quantify samus question when he said that uganda we have no culture what he meant to say is that uganda is a multinational state there are many nations within the same country the bachiga nation and acholi nation all those are independent but there is no culture that, that that actually so supports insult what, and fight what he was trying to say is that we have no agglomerated mm -hmm. no cohesive point actually yes, the, uh, uh, no I'll, i'll use 30 seconds just it's when you when you say the when we, when they say uganda is a developing country they don't mean it only money money wise we are money developing yeah. a group of societies into a nation yeah. so it is a deliberate move to mm. socially engineer things yeah. like civics that will now create a national culture yeah. it's a very big omission to say that mm. african it's it's a very wide thing so let us take developing country in its full meaning yeah. we are developing all these things together and so the state has social engineering role, role especially in civics yeah. Yeah. I, i i agree i agree i agree of course uh, 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 of course you cannot he cannot say and uh, speak and i feel to Trust but the, the role of the state like you said i am sure you listen to your background all of us listen Start to your seconds, background yeah. right yeah. The, the, the legal background the framework the paperwork i think that's the role of the state all that has has not been pro promulgated by by kenyan mm. <laughs> the ugandan state 
it has been systemically mm. arranging this paperwork so that it guides society. Development mm. means multidimensional systemic growth mm. of, 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 of those dimensions that govern, that make up the society. The mm. political di dimension, the social dimension, the economic dimension, and administrative dimension. We are growing as a country. And the paperwork that you mentioned, I don't want to go there because of time. It is part of the role of the state that has been uh, undertaking to make sure there is arrangement and organization and how people should run. Mm. That's all. Yeah, I, I think um, just to sum up the, <laughs> the debate yeah. between you two, I think what I pick from Sam's point mm. is that Uganda, like I said, is a multinational state. And therefore, our national interest and also foreign policy will be shaped by, by the fact that we are divergent people. So at times it's hard to come with a common set of, of you know, values and principles to govern society. But also I have to acknowledge the fact that the state has played a role and it has been very you know, tremendous in terms of putting up the legal framework Absolutely. and you know, doing what needs to be done in Absolutely. terms of policy. Uh, just to sum it up, naturally, let me come to you. Your Did president, the, 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 <laughs> president <laughs> the president of your party has been a very big beneficiary of digital rights, at least in the past couple of weeks. <laughs> he has used these Twitter accounts to the most of his ability. So do you think there are digital rights? Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Whether there are digital rights is a subject or topic of a whole debate for another day. Mm. However, I want to think, and I surely know that there, the digital rights in this country have been violated. Uh, we have seen several cases, like my sister mentioned, the Kakwenza incident. We have had several of the opposition politicians who have been dragged because they aired their own opinions, which is not right. We have seen the Ugandan parliament move a member's bill to, to bring up at least a law, an act, right? An act that would help protect the digital rights. But we also know that as much as this is being brought up, it may not be in good faith because they are looking for a way to bring people to the wall, especially those that use the, the their digital rights in a way that does not feel sweet on their side because they think everyone must sweetly speak about them even when things don't don't work out right. So I want to say conclusively that as much as they move that motion in parliament, they must also be sure to protect the digital rights because that is surely a right that you cannot take away. As much as you may try to put people to the world because they are airing out their opinion. You will not manage. It is already, you already lost the battle. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. And um, that brings us by all means to the end of this conversation. <coughs> and thank the panelists. You've been an amazing panel. Comrade Maxon, Comrade Yvonne, Comrade Sam and Comrade Nachtenda. You've all been amazing. To the viewers, Thank you for sparing the time to keep it youth round table every single week. To the technical team, Dugu Rashid and, and your team, thank you very much for ensuring that our viewers get this show right on time. The youth round table continues to celebrate the month of women. And to conclude this, I leave you with a quote by Samora Machel. Samora Machel was a Frelimo liberation leader who said that the liberation of women should not be seen as an act of international need or as a humanitarian action, but rather as a move to towards sustainable development. Let's empower the women. Let's break the bias as we continue to celebrate the month of women. From us to you, happy week and enjoy the month of women. Thank you. See you next week. Bye-bye.